I'm going to share my screen and I will catch up to you and you can, um, you can take it away, Matan. Will we be starting at Protestantism, Jacobinism? Uh, yeah, sure. The, you have the reins. <clears throat> Such ruminations, however, are of a purely formal nature. In the best tradition of the exasperating abstract reflections on quote-unquote dialectical method, what they lack is the interrelatedness to a concrete historical content. As soon as we move to this level, the level of a concrete historical content, the idea of a fourth surplus mo moment as vanishing mediator between the second moment, the split, the abstract opposition, the rose is red, and the final result, reconciliation, immediately acquires concrete contours. One has only to think of the way Frederick Jameson, in his essay on Max Weber, articulates the notion of van vanishing mediator apropos of Weber's theory of the role of Protestantism in the rise of capitalism. This theory is usually read as, and was also meant by Weber himself to be a criticism of the Marxist thesis of the primacy of economic infrastructure. Ultimately, Weber's point is that Protestantism was a condition of capitalism. Jameson, on the contrary, interprets Weber's theory as fully compatible with Marxism, as the elaboration of the dialectical necessity by means of which, in feudalism's passage into capitalism, the normal relationship between base and superstructure is now inverted, wherein precisely consists this dialectical necessity, in other words, how specifically does Protestantism create conditions for the emergence of capitalism? Not as one would expect by limiting the reach of religious ideology, by undermining its all per pervasive presence characteristic of medieval society, but on the contrary, by universalizing its relevance. Luther was opposed to cloisters and church as an institution apart, separated by a gap from the rest of society because he wanted the Christian attitude to penetrate and determine our entire secular everyday life, contrary to the traditional pre-Protestant stance, which basically limits the relevance of religion to the aims towards which we must tend while leaving the means, the domain of secular economic activity to non-religious common judgment. The Protestant work ethic conceives the very secular activity of economic acquisitiveness as the domain of the disclosure of God's grace. So uh, this uh, just occurred to me. It didn't. I didn't put it in my exegesis, uh, but I'll but I'll put it here. Uh, you know, uh, a way of a way of saying this is a dirty joke is you know Luther kind of warmed up the pool, kind of made it more comfortable for everybody to get in it, but he it warmed, made it more possible. More he warmed possible up the bath. Oh, pardon me. I just wanted to make a joke. He warmed up the bathroom seat. If you know anything about Luther, he yeah, uh, he had digestion issues. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he warmed he warmed up the. Uh, I wish I could fold that into there, but be, here, here, I'll, I'll still, I'll use excrement anyway. Uh, he warmed up the pool so that less people would notice that he pissed in it, you know. And and like in when we're conceiving of the vanishing mediator, the 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 smoke and it's a smoke and mirrors technique, right? And so the 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 usefulness of the instrumentalization of Pro Protestantism is it didn't require luther to want to bring about capitalism that was obviously that could not have been his his motivation um but it cert his motivations were seem clear to us in hindsight uh just getting away from the tyrannical rule of the of the catholic church the the things that that separated him from the more power that he wanted but coincidentally it ended with him uh well at least the the feudalist version of of the of of the the patriarch in him uh lost lost in the end uh overall mm -hmm. i actually you know i think in a sense you're overestimating and underestimating martin luther at the same time because that way he he put he started from like this idealistic position but if you're uh i don't know if you know about the peasants revolt that that eventually came about uh through which basically like uh these peasants in Germany aimed to kind of like overthrow the rulers directly. Uh, they were mainly like, they, they followed like the Calvinists who were like a more extremist version of the Protestants. 
but then he was like nah kill these guys I, they're gonna they're gonna force me to be in a position where i'm gonna have to actually like rebuild society from the ground up rather than you know uh, appropriate the form that already exists for the ends of like uh uh creating a christianized state which is re reduces this gap well that's that's a great insight yeah which ties I'll, I'll continue this ties into what Zizek goes on to say this shift can be exemplified by the changed place of asceticism in the traditional catholic universe Asceticism concerns a stratum of people separated from everyday secular life, devoted to representing in this world its beyond, heaven on earth, saints, monks with their abstinence. Whereas Protestantism requires of every Christian to act ascetically in his secular life, to accumulate wealth instead of spending it thoughtlessly, to live in temperance and modesty, in short, to accomplish his instrumental economic activity with God in mind. Asceticism as the affair of a stratum apart thereby becomes superfluous. This universalization of the Christian stance, the affirmation of its relevance for secular economic activity, generates the attributes of the Protestant work ethic, which consists of compulsive work and accumulation of wealth, the renunciation to consumption as an end in itself. Simultaneously, Yet unknowingly and unintentionally, following the cunning of reason, it opens the way to the devaluation of religion, to its confinement to the intimacy of a private sphere, separated from state and public affairs. I almost made a, a slip right there, a fear, which I made that slip also in the past reading. The Protestant universalization of the Christian stance is thus merely a transitory stage in the passage to the quote unquote normal state of bourgeois society, where religion is reduced to means to a medium enabling the subject to find new strength and perseverance in the economic fight for survival like those techniques of self-experience which put the encounter of our true self in the service of our fitness and you know uh if i may add a personal comment you know what this reminds me of this reminds me of kind of like nietzsche's entire point about modernity which he draws different political conclusions from, but he he, he shares this, uh, and Jameson points this out in his essay, where what the Protestant like political moment leads to is a separation of the means from the ends, in the sense that the work itself is now desacralized, and while this puts this now puts the subject in a position. Where again, yeah, they're they're like private, almost alienated from from religion because religion has become the alienated form of the state, right? But in from this alienated position, even though it you know desacralizes the uh, the 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 work, the labor, it puts the subject in the position from which, as alienated from it, they can now judge the values themselves right well it's it's the lie of uh we are now free to sell our labor on the market that's that's a lie it, it's R that's, rugged that's, individualism yeah that's the dawning of that lie of well you're free now the onus is on you when in reality um no the the onus is not on us the responsibility has been privatized is what's actually happening yeah and and for, furthermore i i think what's What's kind of lacking here is the kind of common person's experience. And and part of the reason it's lacking is there obviously won't be much documentation of it, but we can we can make some assumptions based on our own experiences. The common person's experience of, uh, with religion uh, at that time would have been, you know, you've got to be at a place once a week. You got to go to a person whose job it is to tell you about God once a week, and then you go back and you do your shit. Now you are free from that. You 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 now have a personal relationship with God. You better make sure you're praying every goddamn day. You got to make sure it, it is your now your responsibility. And uh, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, uh, and and this is I think this is again back to the kind of smoke and mirrors aspect of the vanishing mediator. This is the way of burying the lie of primitive acquisition underneath a 
a, a kind of pastiche of of asceticism where it's this person has a lot of wealth because they managed to not spend it as opposed to they man as opposed to they liberated it from you ahead of time and have continued to do so mm -hmm. and, yeah, so and this is what sets the stage for prosperity gospel and such mm. yeah, so in, in their opposition to uh i suppose you could say like the catholic the catholic way of life at the time what they rather accomplished was to obscure as you said yeah like the primitive accumulation and create a myth of what marx would say is like so-called accumulation mm. which rather than address the discrepancy of like the catholic church at the time they rather created you know that that twist in the mobius strip which allowed things to you know connect yes yeah and and we we skip right over or to go to another uh, earlier reference he had uh, the spot at which the spot in the escher uh drawing at which it goes from uh waterfall to uh stream or whatever the there's it's this the that's the the switch the 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 super trick, what I call to my daughter the tricky trick that they pull, and then once it's once it's there once it's gone and it becomes reified, it's now it now becomes uh, sacrilegious to even acknowledge that that happened. What we're doing right now is heresy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so so the the particular type of sublation that takes place here, rather than like a destruction, is evident especially. You know, Martin Luther, uh, there was one like in institution of the church that he kept, which was baptism, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. That that was something that the Protestants and even the Calvinists weren't willing to take away, which is pretty interesting. I think there's a, there is a, what I would say, probably a pretty obvious benefit in having certain kinds of rituals of renewal and of rebirth. Mm -hmm. ways ways to to make it possible to do impossible things um and you you know so you need things like transubstantiation you need magic that is just magic because you say it's magic yeah you need folk traditions um mm -hmm. and you need you need to safely incorporate those into your you know culture yeah, sure. of ult ultimately your culture of control sure um, and it's i'm glad you mentioned sorry or please continue i didn't mean to interrupt no yeah 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 go uh, I'm glad you men mentioned like magician because uh, what, what Luther and the Protestants did was they essentially took like the uh, the magic element of uh, Catholicism at the time and, and its promise of like immediate gain. And they tried to kind of institutionalize that into a bureaucracy that can kind of uh, conceive of a more, I don't know, what, what can we say, like a, a, a more universal doctrine instead. Mm -hmm. But what you get instead is like a, a modern man where you get it, in which case bureaucracy is the method through which you gain uh, immediate, you know, self-satisfaction, you know, at the cost of the universal doctrine, which they had hoped to implement in the first place. Well, I mean, you you at the at the cost of the universal doctrine as written at that time, uh, you know, in the end, you end up with you end up with what becomes the universal doctrine one way or the other. When, I, when um, I say universal doctrine, I mean the universal doctrine in the name of which the Protestants uh, changed everything rather than, you know. You mean specifically the what's the, written in the, the, the fucking the, thing? Un, the unthought aspect of, of what or the not even the idealized form of what the Protestants thought they were implementing because it, it, that was achieved in its basic notion, but rather the illusion itself that that would lead mm. to an unalienated society. Mm, yeah, yes. yeah. The lie. Well, free beer tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Free beer tomorrow, right? Free beer tomorrow only for the uh, the monks who read scrupulously. Oh, and you'll know you'll know if you're a good person if you ended up with beer, and if you didn't end up with beer, then be a better person tomorrow. There'll be free beer the next day. Oh yeah, I was. You know, I I have to read this quote from Zupanchich because you just you said it so perfect. It, it, it really. Hold on, let me see. You know, we're definitely violating that whole 70-30 thing, which I'm super... Uh, What's that? Dave <laughs> said he'd, he'd like things to be like a 70% uh, actual reading, 30% exe exegesis. Mm. Uh, but this is such a good quote here that you kind of like invoked right now. Well, I've already read this three times. So, I mean, we're we're ahead of the game, boys. Mm -hmm. Let me read this quote <laughs> really quickly. This is from Ottawa on in page six. Success is becoming almost a biological notion, and thus the foundation of a genuine racism of successfulness. 
Mm -hmm. The poorest and the most miserable are no longer perceived as a socioeconomic class, but almost as a race of their own, as a special mm -hmm. form of life. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I'll say one more comment and then we, I think we should get back to reading, which is, yeah, uh, so what, what the Protestant movement did was essentially uh, this, like, entire, like, dialectic of self-exteriorization or self-alienation, um, which is characteristic of, you know, of the way Zizek describes, you know, Hegel's improvement on Kant. Um, so rather than actually, you know, a achieving any, like, uh, or... The illusion of radical change is not that radical change is possible, but that radical change will uh, will go the way you want it to. Yeah. I, I put that very poorly, but yeah, think... like it's it's not that you don't have to already be living in the promised land, but the fact that you will be included in the promised land when it comes, mm -hmm. um, you've already got your golden ticket that gives you the uh, investment in. Um. Yeah, you're you're putting your uh cart before your horse, mm -hmm. or rather, the the ideology is is putting the cart be before the horse for you, so you don't have to think about it. You don't have to. But interestingly enough, enough for interestingly enough for Zizek, this doesn't like uh this doesn't dissuade him from like endorsing radical revolutionary movements. Um, in fact, in in terms of the Jacobins, the 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 quote unquote failure of the Protestants uh, characterizes the particular form that the Jacobin form of uh, revolution revolt will take. With that being said, you're, shall you're we... jumping ahead. Yes, you're yeah. jumping ahead. Shall we continue? <laughs> Would one of you like we, to? Uh... We better before you before you you make Zizek's point for him. Yeah. What are, are we at this universe universalization of the Christian stance? It is of course easy. Yep. Uh, okay. It is of course easy. Yep. Oh, sorry. Wait. 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 I thought oh, yeah, that's yeah, where yeah, we were. Yeah, 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 that's correct. It is, of course, easy. All right, I'll I'll, I'll go from there. Uh, it is, of course, easy to assume an ironic distance towards the Protestant illusion, and to the point out, and to point out how the final result of Protestant endeavors to abolish the gap between religion and everyday life was the debasement of religion to a quote therapeutic and quote mean. What is far more difficult is to conceive the necessity of Protestantism as the, quote, vanishing mediator, end quote, between medieval corporatism and capitalist individualism. In other words, the point not to be missed is that one cannot pass from medieval closed society to bourgeois society immediately without the intercession of Protestantism as vanishing mediator. It is Protestantism which, by means of its universalization of Christianity, prepares the ground for its withdrawal into the sphere of privacy. In the political domain, a similar role was played by Jacobinism, which can even be determined as, quote-unquote, political Protestantism. Jacobinism universalizes the democratic political ideological project in the same way. It does not grasp it as a mere formal political principle without immediate bearing on economic, family, etc. relations, but endeavors to make the democratic egalitarian project into a principle structuring the totality of social life. The trap into which Jacobinism fell is also the same. Unknowingly, its political radicalism prepared the way for its opposite, for the bourgeois universe of egotistic and acquisitive individuals who care not a pin for egalitarian moralism. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, yeah, so so the like Luther and the Protestants' role specifically was, you know, as a prophet to transition from magic, from, you know, oh, I give money to the church, now I'm saved, to... Oh, I participate in this bureaucracy. I get good shit. I get yeah. good shit. Well, it, it's it's interesting how this is. We're all seeing this now with, uh, you know, I I sit on my my ass and consume, consume, consume. But I posted a fucking awoke Instagram post, and so all mm -hmm. my sins are abolished or uh, paid for or whatever. And I'm I am one of the good ones. Yeah, and now I get to well, attack my enemies. Yeah, I get I get to point out them for not being as a. Uh, yeah, and as, as, as spend cool all day people. long laughing at them and making fun of it, and and that is that is seen as oh yeah, I'm a radical activist. I'm going to make fun of poor working people. It 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 very much appeals to our need for a, a mediated uh, moral system, uh, one in which we can we can 
shuffle around various various cards until they appear to fit. Um, and you can see why this if with this uh, uh nat- occurred to Weber to write about as as a as a more of a, uh, a teleological uh stance uh, thinking about the bureaucracy as having or th- thinking about sorry thinking about uh, protestantism as being the basis for capitalism as opposed to simply a a co-contingent uh you know moment um that essentially set the stage for it um or but it would have been it would have been something it would have been something else it wouldn't have needed to have been protestantism anything that not vaguely aligned with what was already going to be a bureaucratized mediated moral system that allowed for a separation between a given human being and their labor um yeah to was was gonna work so yeah. it didn't need to be protestantism it just it just did become that way He's, yeah and i think that's that's what's that's what's so hard to grasp and i think when it what you were referring to earlier Matan, about about uh, jameson's uh question about Zizek's ultimate you know s- s- supposition that that it, it all seems so aleatory it all seems so luck of the draw but that doesn't change the fact it doesn't change the it doesn't change the facts on the ground we what he'll go on to say later i i guess i'll jump ahead here what he'll go on to say later pointing out that it's like you know the fact is it's easy to bet on the right horse when the race had already been been run and so yeah. we can say that protestantism was a necessary a necessary uh you know condition of capitalism only because we don't have all of the contingencies that didn't that didn't happen well i mean to us. go back to the burgess shale i mean it's the same Precisely. the same exact argument the same exact you know operating we're always after the fact and that's all we have that's all we can do and then the the link between the jacobins and the protestants of course is that both of them uh both both systems were deadly serious about their project and because they were so successful in the serious and the, in the execution of their project, they of course be created the new normal into which they lost their relevance, retreated into figurehead status. Mm. Yeah, again, uh, Luther he he did not support the German peasant rule. He, he very clearly, you know, called for their deaths. Did that go on to be the Anabaptists? Yeah, yeah. You had a, uh, you had like a lot of people. You had like the the Munsters. Yeah, the Munster guy. You had the Calvinists. Yeah. Um, I don't recall. You know, there's so much crazy stuff that happened during the Thirty Years' War, uh, which ties into his point later about uh, monarchy absolutism. I'm Shall I'm we- I'm always very skeptical and 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 uh, uh, hesitant to be too reliant on on historical facts and figures and such you know uh because i i feel i feel concerned that i i forget that these are by nature of being history these are narratively driven so we are getting the hindsight we're getting the uh hermeneutics course, man yeah. everything is hermeneutics and, and you know jameson's point is that uh His point is that we we basically that's all we have starting from like a uh, a synchronous position where where you know phenomenologically things seem like a like especially like in the moment or in our lifetime you know our social system and things like that is presented as closed as a I don't know a complete totality right that you know but that's when it's actually if, that's if, pure if subjectivity have, yeah, if we try to project that backwards uh, and create a story that is itself synchronous which relies on narrative, as you say, you know, things will eventually kind of, uh, there will be holes in that story. But the the point is, isn't that we simply like say, oh, this isn't like a reliable, we have to engage in like an allegorical analysis as well as a like factual one of like the, the, the methods and, and I don't know, form itself. Yeah. Precisely. And uh, is, you know, maybe, sorry, please go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was going to make actually a... Please, please go ahead. I just... Oh, I was just going to suggest we continue reading, but you should finish your thought. Thing. 
I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. You want to go, Nance? Yeah. We're at here too. Here too, it is easy to assume an ironic distance and point out how the Jacobins, by means of their violent reduction of the social totality to the abstract principle of equality, necessarily finished in terrorism. Since this reduction is resisted by the ramified network of concrete relations that characterize civil society, see Hegel's classical criticism of the Jacobins in the Phenomenology of Spirit, what is far more difficult to accomplish is to demonstrate why no immediate passage was possible from the ancient regime to the egotistic bourgeois everyday life, why, precisely because of their illusory reduction of social totality to the democratic political project, the Jacobins were a necessary vanishing mediator. Therein, not in the commonplaces about the utopian terrorist character of the Jacobinical project, consists the effective point of Hegel's criticism. In other words, it is easy to detect in Jacobinism the roots and the first form of modern totalitarianism. It is far more difficult and disquieting to acknowledge and assume fully the fact that, without the Jacobinical excess, there would be no normal pluralist democracy. I love Zizek's, uh, in other words, is yes, they're they're always so illuminating, and that's why you were saying Matan earlier that you were gonna you were gonna try to uh, uh, read backwards. That's that's the benefit there. You start out with the in other words, and then you actually get the explication. Hmm. Nance, could you read the uh, the footnote on page two twenty three for number six? It's quite it's a quite important one, I think. It's yeah. one that I actually disagree with somewhat. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Was that six? Yes, yeah, six. six. Yeah. What is unusual about Jameson's text is that text is that it does not mention the role of Weber himself as the vanishing mediator between the traditional pre-positivist approach to society and 20th century sociology as objective science. Mm. As Jameson points out, Weber's notion of that of yeah, a value right. Freiheit. of a Bert's value free Freiheit. stance yeah. uh, a value free stance is not yet the later positivist neutrality it expresses a pre-positivist Nietzschean attitude of distance toward values which enables us to accomplish a transvaluation of values and thus a more efficient intervention into social reality in other words that implies a very interested attitude toward reality okay so i'd like to hear your uh your disagreement sure i mean i think i think jameson is maybe not like super explicit like like literally saying it out loud as much as jizik or the same way jizik is saying it here but i mean right from the beginning yeah uh jameson does like he he's relating uh weber's own shift uh, of uh as as Zizek describes it uh, in the beginning of this uh, section, uh, the shift from the economic focus to the uh, political one in the way that Zizek describes uh, with regard to, uh, what was it, conceiving uh, Protestantism as a condition of capitalism rather than, uh, well, yeah, the, basically, uh, Jameson like directly connects this to uh, to the neuroses of like the Victorian family, yeah. Which Weber, and Weber's you, own neuroses. Yeah, if you know anything about Weber, he was like just super like embedded in that environment of like uh, I, I don't know uh, how to put it. Well, I, you know, I I got about eight pages into that essay, so yeah. I, I I don't have the to, the totality no, of I, it I under think, my I think belt. Even even like three pages is enough or something like that. He well, absolutely. I mean, he yeah. does that. That's where I, I I would say I sort of disagree with with Zizek saying that he doesn't mention the role of Weber himself when when Jameson was actually very explicit about J, uh, Weber's specific role and his intent was to try to navigate the the many uh conflicting factors of society at the time all of which he had pro individual problems with with socialism with with the certain what i i don't recall the names of the individual groups but but there were there were different problems that he was trying to manage at the same time and as far as as far as bringing about a value free stance it was absolutely uh it was absolutely um 
interested. He he had an interest in promoting uh, the concept of of uh, what was it ideal type. Um, but the interest was not to create a vanishing mediator, but instead to provide a means of making a science out of something that is, uh, you know, inherently humanistic. And so being able to keep the distance between the human, the human and the number. And one is supposed to be mindful of the fact that it is an ideal type, an ideal type being a utopian concept, utopian being impossible to actually transcend. And that the intent, his, his intent was absolutely to, was, was interested in humanism, but was not to be a vanishing mediator. And I, 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 I wouldn't, I think, I think Zizek goes a bit far uh, in, in kind of that, uh, how, how you would say, saying it's being a pre-positivist as if, as if down the road, he, his intent was to create a positive positivism. I don't think, I don't think that, I don't think that's what, what Jameson, uh, I, I agree that Jameson was not doing that. But I, but I think Jameson was right for not doing that <laughs> personally. No, no, but no. I, oh, so, oh, so you disagree with me on, on that front? To oh, some, to some degree, I, I do. I, I don't, I don't think. I that, would say. I, oh, sorry, please. I don't think that Jameson. Uh, what I, I agree with Zizek saying that Jameson doesn't explicitly mention Weber as a vanishing mediator because he, Jameson was interacting with with uh, Weber. As a as a human being, and as you as you noted, uh, you know, calling out his 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 position in history as a person with with uh, psychoses and and with the the society itself being um, completely saturated with uh, neurological problems, um, but the the vanishing mediator was what was what Weber instantiated what what he brought about with the uh, concept of of distance in sociology. Um, with the ideal type and so Weber as a vanishing mediator I mean it it just seems a little extra to 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 paint Weber that way uh, because I don't think anybody invokes Weber in in the sense of what therefore we are objective yeah uh you know let, let's not make like a whole argument about this because it really is such a minor point in, in the relative scheme of things uh you yeah, know actually it's reader, interesting viewer please check it out for yourself uh, <laughs> yeah Talk about it in the comments, etc. Um, so please, let's continue. From that is to say, or shall I continue? Uh, I'll I'll pick it up. That is to say, the illusion into which Protestantism and Jacobinism are enmeshed is more complicated than may seem on first approach. It does not consist simply in their narrative moralistic universalization of the Christian or egalitarian democratic project. That is, in their overlooking the concrete wealth of social relations that resist such an immediate universalization. Their illusion is far more radical. It is of the same nature as the illusion of all historically relevant political utopias. The illusion into which Marx drew attention apropos Plato's state when he remarked that Plato did not see how what he effectively described was a not yet realized ideal, but the very fundamental structure of the existing Greek state. In other words, utopias are utopian, not because they depict an impossible ideal, a dream not for this world, but because they misrecognize the way their ideal state is already realized in its basic content, in its notion, as Hegel would say. Protestantism becomes superfluous. It can vanish as a mediator. The moment the very social reality is structured as a Protestant universe, the notional structure of capitalist civil society is that of a world of atomized individuals defined by the paradox of acquisitive asceticism. The more you possess, the more you must renounce consumption. That is to say, the structure of the Protestant content without its positive religious form. And it is the same with Jacobinism. What the Jacobins overlooked is the fact that the ideal after which they strove was, in its notional structure, already realized in the dirty acquisitive activity which appeared to them as a betrayal of their high ideals. Vulgar, egotistic, bourgeois, everyday life is the actuality of freedom, equality, and brotherhood, freedom of free trade, formal equality in the eyes of the law, and so on. The illusion proper to the vanishing mediators, Protestants, Jacobins, is precisely that of the Hegelian beautiful soul. They refuse to acknowledge in the corrupted reality over which they lament the ultimate consequence of their own act. Mm -hmm. as, Le as Lacan would put it, their own message in its true inverted form. And our illusion as sobered inheritors of Protestantism and Jacobinism is no less. 
we perceive those vanishing mediators as aberrations or excesses, failing to notice how we are nothing but Jacobins without the Jacobinical form, nothing but Protestants without the Protestant form. Capitalist realists. When you we, you're reading the uh, Hegelian beautiful soul part, I, my mind flashed to the meme of someone uh, riding a bike, sticking a putting a stick in the spokes, and then going why? Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> well, I, I mean, for, for they know not what they do, but they know very well. But and yet, you know, um. You know, yeah, yeah, somewhere in the gap of where we don't know, we enjoy, as he says in the beginning. Yeah. I'll take it over from here. And other vanishing mediators. This gap between the form and its notional content offers us also the key to the necessity of the vanishing mediator. The passage from feudalism to Protestantism is not of the same nature as the passage from Protestantism to bourgeois everyday life with its privatized religion. The first passage, that of feudalism to Protestantism, concerns content under the guise of preserving the religious form or even its strengthening. The crucial shift, the assertion of the ascetic acquisitive stance in economic activity as the domain of the manifestation of grace takes place. Whereas the second passage from Protestantism to bourgeois everyday life is a purely formal act, a change of form. As soon as Protestantism is realized as the ascetic acquisitive stance, it can fall off this form. The vanishing mediator therefore emerges because of the way in a dialectical process form stays behind content. Uh, I'll add my own personal note if you recall from Hegelian Lalong. Uh, it, this is basically a description of like a, in a more concretized historical form of how like a, in the first like set of judgments uh, it's it's the predicate which is which is the one that experiencing is experiencing some content like change in content which yields eventually into this kind of deadlock, which which must be, uh, I guess, sublated by, you know, then proceeding to the second judgment uh, or the second set of judgments, which, which you know, flip everything in, in which case the, in which case, you know, it's the moment you, you go to, you, you, you go from, for instance, uh, um, all men are mortal to subtracting the particularity of it and getting to man as such is mortal. So from ontology to epistemology. Mm -hmm. But um, the vanishing mediator therefore emerges because of the way in a dialectical process, form stays behind content. First, the crucial shift occurs within the old form, even taking on the appearance of its renewed assertion, the universalization of Christianity, return to its true content, and so on. Then, once the silent weaving of the spirit finishes its work, the old form can fall off. The double scansion of this process enables us to grasp in a concrete way the worn out formula of the negation of negation. The first negation consists in the slow underground invisible change of substantial content, which paradoxically takes place in the name of its own form. Then, once the form has lost its substantial right, it falls to pieces by itself. The very form of negation is negated, or to use the classical Hegelian couple, the change which took place in itself becomes for itself. And then just to weaselly slide in my own uh, Jameson position here, I think this negation of the negation is precisely what he does with regard to Weber and, and the time period which which he, he represented and the sort of ennui, which he kind of uh, uh, embodied, which would as which would be that that was an initial negation of romantic uh, like a feeling of loss, uh, which would then move on to like a, a form of anxiety. At, at at the prospect of like building, which characterizes this uh, sort of uh, position, which Zizek computes to Weber as the vanishing mediator from Victorian era, I don't know, blah blah blah, uh, ennui to uh, a more like uh, revolutionary anxiety. But whatever, the picture should be complicated even a step further. A closer look reveals the presence of two vanishing mediators in the passage from feudal to bourgeois political structure, the absolute monarchy and Jacobinism. The first is the sign, the embodiment of a paradoxical compromise, the political form enabling the, rise, the rising bourgeoisie to strengthen its economic hegemony by breaking the economic power of feudalism, of its guilds and corporations. What is paradoxical about it, of course, is the fact that 
feudalism digs its own grave precisely by absolutizing its own crowning point, by giving absolute power to the monarch. The result of absolute monarchy is thus a political order disconnected from its economic foundation, and the same disconnection characterizes Jacobinism. It is already a commonplace to determine Jacobinism as a radical ideology, which pardon me, takes literally the bourgeoisie, sorry, the bourgeois political program of equality, freedom, and brotherhood, and endeavors to realize it irrespective of the concrete articulation of civil society. Both pay dearly for their illusion. The absolute monarch noticed too late that society praised him as almighty only to allow one class to oust another. The Jacobins also became superfluous once their job of destroying the apparatus of the ancien regime was done, but both were carried away, sorry, both were carried away by the illusion of the autonomy of the political sphere. Both believed in their political mission. One, in the unquestionable character of royal authority, the other in the pertinence of its political project. And could not the same be said on another level for fascism and communism, namely actually existing socialism? Is not fascism a kind of inherent self-negation of capitalism, an attempt to change something, something with it, so that nothing really changes? by means of an ideology which subordinates the economy to the ideological political domain, is not the Leninist actually existing socialism, a kind of socialist Jacobinism, an attempt to subordinate the whole of socioeconomic life to the immediate political regulation of the socialist state? Both are vanishing mediators, but into what? The usual cynical answer from capitalism back to capitalism seems a little bit too easy. Um, I, I'd actually like to pose a question. If if it, I, I mean, uh, if it is this like, like easy to maybe it's only after the fact, but if you can determine like just based off like the, I don't know the moods and and like the 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 Hegelian hysterical theater of every movement, like this this tripartite structure, would it would it I mean wouldn't it, wouldn't you automatically know just by, analyzing the past what position you're in currently or is that. I mean, it, it seems like a little bit too convenient. What do you do? That? That's, that's, I think that's the common, that is like the most common misinterpretation of the Hegelian uh, project anyway, which is that, mm -hmm. that you can imply a, uh, you can imply, you can use what you know of the past to for, predict the future because there is a continuity. That yeah, that implies a, a telos. And while there is a yeah. telos, it, it's, it's always an after the fact telos. Everything, it, it, it Right, Everything if, it's it, if it's after the fact, but it still follows the structure. So if you if you were like analyzing earlier and you're like, okay, well, that was the second part. It's your when, analysis when, that created that structure, though. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, it, it, I see. I think I yeah. You you will always you will always you will not come up with an analysis that doesn't fit that structure because then it would sound it would just seem like fucking chaos. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't you uh I I've got a in fact. I happen to have in front of me a nice Irving Goffman quote um, discussing actually the uh, the tendencies of sociologists. He uses a wonderful word. Um, here, let's see here. All right. Okay. So to un to uncover the informing constitutive rules of everyday behavior would be to perform the sociologist's alchemy. Mm. The the transmutation of any patch of ordinary social activity into an illuminating publication. Um, I I found that really interesting because uh, here's here here's a another aphorism he 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 drops in the next one. Uh, one is faced with the embarrassing methodological fact that the announcement of constitutive rules seems an open ended game that any number can play forever. Mm. The, the the fact is you you can come up with you can come up with a structure that will make sense no matter what you do. Um, what you can't do is come up with all of the things that might've happened that didn't uh, and then make any sense of that. The only thing that's going to make sense is what you determine to be necessity. And that's precisely what's intended uh, by necessity being composed of contingencies. <laughs> um, and it, that's the unfortunate, the unfortunate thing is that is very unsatisfying for people who want to have a one for one to one relationship between what they think will happen and what will happen. Mm -hmm. And just, just your own personal, like what's your own personal ethical position in response to this? The ethics on this is, is uh, yeah. I, I think that the, the only ethics I can derive from this, from this text, it, uh, comes to, I, I think, 
I think it's why I it's I think it's what because we can't distance ourselves from it or otherwise we put ourselves in in the barbarian position right no I think no matter what we do whatever we do in a in a positive in, in in any kind of form of positive positive a statement whatever we do will be in some sense a hypocritical uh act of of uh of uh hubris no matter what we do but in terms of the the ethics here the the mandate i i take the mandate to be that we need to be a lot more cognizant of how much how much we misperceive object uh, subjectivity for objectivity mm. how much how much we presume tell us where where it ain't we can presume tell us in hindsight what we can't do is use that and and then start making moralistic uh, arguments about what may happen in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what, I mean, you see, you see a lot of, you see a lot of uh, Slavoj Zizek going around b making these kinds of wishy-washy. I very much support the trans, but, and, and all of that comes down to the fact that the, the ethic we de derive from, the, or at least the ethic I derive from this is that whenever you are, whenever you find yourself convinced that you have, come up with a nice totalized system that is almost the that is the moment where you're almost certainly the most wrong mm -hmm. but you know Lacan sort of has a has his own way of characterizing like the the way kind of that represents a new type of ideology from the the nom du pair the the name of the father to the non du mm -hmm. heirs you know so um it would be interesting I, I'm interested in like maybe not now outrun but, the sun yeah you you just gotta outrun the sun. You know what? <laughs> hey, whoever's listening, you know the, the three people who are gonna watch this. Please in the comments, uh, write about this. You know, start a discussion. Anyways, uh, where were we? The inverted. I mean, we're formerly yes. unconcerned yep. about people watching this, and and, and we became concerned. Only in so far. Only in so far as uh, I can opportunistically use them to uh, you know construct my own argument. Thinking in concert. Yeah. Augmenting our own intelligence. I'll return on my alt account with some hot GPT takes. There we go. <laughs> uh, you want to take it, Adam? Well, yeah, where, where, sorry, where are we? I lost myself in the various Google Docs I've got all over my fucking screen. The inversion, uh, page 187. Okay. The inversion of the uh, normal relationship of content economic basis and its ideological form which renders possible the anti-marxist reading of weber consists therefore in the above described emancipation of form from its content that characterizes the vanishing mediator the break of protestantism with the medieval church does not reflect new social content but is rather the criticism of the old feudal content in the name of the radicalized version of its own ideological form it is this emancipation of the Christian form from its own social content that opens up the space for the gradual transformation of the old into the new capitalist content. It is easy for Jameson thus to demonstrate how Weber's theory of the crucial role of Protestantism in the emergence of capitalism affects only vulgar econom economism and is quite compatible with the dialectic of base and ideological superstructure, according to which one passes from one social formation to another through a vanishing mediator. Jesus, Slavoj, give me a fucking comma. <sighs> Which inverts the relationship between base and superstructure. By emancipating itself from its own base, the old superstructure prepares the terrain for the transformation of the base. The classical Marxist theoretical edifice is thus saved. The emancipation of the ideological form is explained from the inner antagonism of the base itself. It emerges when these antagonisms become so violent that they can no longer be legitimized by their own ideological form. Um, whole a whole lot of words, which to me feel like it 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 very much boils down to the uh, the again the betting on the uh, the the race after the fact. You've you what what's hap what happens is you end up you end up constructing a narrative that obviously fits and then you go, therefore that must've been what that had to have been what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, actually this, this ties back into the, the, the kind of uh, confusion we just had a second ago, as well as to the question of uh, 
that, that I brought up that Jameson asks with regard to the act of Zizek enunciating this as like a, a position that one can take, you know, as proposing this as a position that one can take. Um, I don't have anything more besides that, actually. I just think that's really interesting. Um, okay, uh, I'll continue. Um, there is an inherent tragical ethical dimension proper to this emancipation, uh, quote unquote, of the ide ideological superstructure. It presents a unique point at which an ideology takes itself literally. Now here, I'm just going to pause. I'm going to break in. This is, uh, I wrote down a note about the fact that uh, that w if there is an ethical mandate, it is r be cognizant of the fact that what you are drinking is in fact Kool-Aid. All right. And and not to forget that what you're doing is drinking Kool-Aid. Um, and and like you said, that that might mean we are now the non-duped heirs. That, that may be a, a better position. Who knows? Um, I lost myself. Where we are. Uh, da, 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 Forgive da, da, da. me. Objectively cynical. Which ideally takes itself literally. Yeah, and ceases to function as an objectively cynical Marx legitimization of the existing power relations. Let us mention another more contemporary case, the quote unquote new social movements that emerged during the last years of actually existing socialism in Eastern Europe. Movements whose exemplary representative is the new forum in the former GDR. Groups of passionate intellectuals who took socialism seriously and were prepared to stake everything in order to destroy the compromise system and replace it with the utopian third way beyond capitalism and actually existing socialism. Their sincere belief and insistence that they were not working for the restoration of Western capitalism, of course, proved to be nothing but insub an insubstantial illusion. However, we could say that precisely as such, as thorough illusion, as a thorough illusion without substance, it was strictly speaking non-ideological. It did not reflect in inverted ideological form any actual relations of power. At this point, we should correct the Marxist Vulgate. Uh, that's a big old word that I had to stop and look up. And it basically just is, is what synonymous with doxa. It's just kind of uh, the standard way of thinking, right? Well, are we all taking it to mean that? I Googled it too. Um, at this point, uh, we should correct the uh, standard Marxist take contrary to the commonplace according to which an ideo ideology becomes cynical, accepts the gap between words and acts, doesn't believe in itself anymore. It is, is no longer experienced as truth, but treats itself as pure instrumental means of legitimizing power. In the period of the decadence of social formation, it could be said that the that precisely the period of decadence opens up the to the ruling ideology the possibility of taking itself seriously, and effects, effectively opposing itself to its own social base. With Protestantism, the Christian religion opposes feudalism as its social base, just as the New Forum opposes the existing socialism in the name of true socialism. In this way, unknowingly, it unchains the forces of its own fin final destruction. Once their job is done, they are overrun by history. New Forum polled 3% at the elections. It's fucking Zizek. And the new scoundrel time sets in with people in power who were mostly silent during the communist repression and who nonetheless now abuse the New Forum as crypto communist. Um, this is obvious. I mean, to me, this this seems very like a, a very this is clearly shown in modern academia under the the kinds of things that i think are being called woke mm -hmm. um the concepts of like uh you know making a dei uh statement that you have to you have to explain land. all of what you're doing to to increase diversity and uh land acknowledgments land acknowledgments and and all of these things that at, you know on on their face uh, are are almost incontestably good things to do but which uh, which we realize we can we can see how how that is being you know operationalized by the by the the superstructure of power uh to further uh to 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 further the ends of power uh using us as the means and using that uh cynically and you you end up with people in in positions of power perhaps that are drinking the hell out of that Kool-Aid, you end up with certain politicians that truly do believe in their, in their project. Mm -hmm. um, that but that project. 
Yeah, to explicate a little bit further, it's in the service of, of a power though, which which is is kind of disintegrating because the yes. the the enjoyment that one gets from this is the enjoyment of you know taking this high moral position in order to terrorize others. Yeah. Well, and it's which the are, taking. It's the taking that that you want. Yeah, but once you've the, got it, it's a whole other. It's a whole other thing. Yeah. So, so this is the exact point that he made about you know Protestantism as well. No. I and the Jacobins, and he'll go on to make it o- over and over again over the next. <laughs> well, I would say the Jacobins were were in a position after. Again, this is me falling into my own trap here. After the position we're in, where the the uh, the form itself has already like lost its legitimacy through its own mis like handling of of the the moral position and and it's kind of lost faith among the public or or it's it's lost its big otherness the big mm-hmm. it, it no longer uh holds that position of the big other in which case you get it like a jacobin position where it's more of like a uh it's more of like a uh what is viewed after the fact as kind of like a uh unregulated violence you know well i think i i so not not to be too uh too contradictory here, but I would Please, say pull, pull out the knife. a couple of a couple of thoughts. The the first one being it's it's very tempting to apply historical precedent to contemporary moments. Um, but again, this is I, I would say our mandate here is to remember that there's nothing about the necessity we see in the form in, in the the Jacobin situation that will be usefully applicable to our current situation. Uh, aside from, uh, of course, uh, you know, applying, giving us theoretical positions from which to view it as a parallax, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but now, so so viewing it as a parallax, one of the things we might say is, if anything, uh, let us hope that we are in the middle of the Jacobinical stage, and ideally uh, moving through it and past it. Uh, you know, we do, we do, I don't know about you, but I do see generalized violence and chaos. Um, I, I think, I think I don't... there's an important point here that, sorry to interrupt, that, that, no, that Zizek will get into later, which is the obscenity of like the founding of the law itself and how that like zone is kind of governed implicitly with unwritten rules. And I think there is still like a sort of, that there's a fidelity to unwritten rules within like academia, which this new, like, uh, again, this position of like moral authority is slowly undermining. Like, mm. And then w- from that, I think you get, I think you get the more like Trumpian form of politics, where the the, the joy is gotten from directly, uh, directly identifying oneself publicly as on the other side of the law. I, it's and, yeah. In, uh, this sense, I, in this sense, I think they're the vanishing mediators. Yeah. But vice and virtue. Yeah, I I like but, that. You know, That's you know, I I think me and Adam are having a very like fruitful disagreement here because I, I I'm he's really like put me in a position of doubt here because I can't I can't hold this position uh, completely without um, kind of a uh, oh yeah well I'm I'm happy to hear that because I you know what what I don't want to obviously what I don't want to come off as is is uh you know just contrarian for no fucking uh point so I, I am happy to hear that that that's helpful to you for for your knowledge I don't have I don't really have a position and so if you know, in a sense, if we are having a disagreement, one of us is not in good faith, and that is this fucking asshole right, right here, man. So, you know, well, we're hey, both, we're f both, in the chat uh, for yeah. my fucking yeah. What <laughs> we're both like a selfish actors, so I think I think that's the best like kind of position for there to be a disagreement. Bro, I'm just trying to grow my subs my subscriber base. You know, yeah. that's 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 why I'm that's why I'm here, man. I can only I'm raise. Just trying, so many I'm just trying chickens. to get better at argument uh, arguments with strangers on the internet. Well, we're doing a good job of cussing a lot. I think that's a that's an important. Na- Nance agrees, right? Nance, yeah. we, I was going to make a really, more... more really nasty joke, but let's hear it. I got. I I need to hear it. <laughs> I got to get a beer. I'll be right back. I'll be hearing you guys though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I as far as uh, well. I can't get out of um you you just said earlier um it goes from ontology to epistemology and that put me in a, a like a japonchic state of mind um and I, like I can't I can't help reading this through the lens of of uh how people do this with their personal identities and and how once you start to take it seriously that's precisely where it fails um 
And that's, I mean, that's exactly what he's saying here with, with history and, and political moments. Um, it sounds, fails, sounds like what we were failing. talking about. Yeah. Oh, sounds sounds like what we were talking about the other day, Nance, where it was a uh, a misconstrual of a of an epistemic situation into an aesthetic on- position, for example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Onto epistemology. You, yeah, you you you're sw- you kind of switching poles instead of reading books to acquire knowledge and to, to grow yourself and your understanding, you're reading books. So you have more shit to say to people and occupy the aesthetic of an, you know, of epistemic operation. Um, And so you're letting, you're being led around by your identity as opposed to doing, doing whatever it is you do and letting the identity follow you. Again, if you, if I read an ethical, if I read any ethics from this, it is to avoid at all costs, allowing yourself to be driven by your by your supposed identity wherever that came from but instead doing the things you do go about your projects as a as a as an emancipated agent as much as you can um even if that is just as a as hegel hegel would put it a convenient fiction Mm -hmm. um if if it's a fiction fine um but it's the only one that provides us any any agency as such yeah mind the gap i mean that's all we can do mind the gap um you know i think i think this is i'm glad i'm talking to you here because this illuminates i i I tried to correct you in the last like uh discussion but i think there's like a profound disagreement here uh that that is like is really interesting because for me it's like not don't mind the gap you know uh put on like a helmet and jump in (laughs) that's what i think yeah yes but also uh but see putting on the helmet is minding it yeah right like you're you're seeing you were you were observing the gap and and ascertaining the the situation uh you know you're doing a sit rep you know there there comes to a point and i think i think there's a a benefit that that i have in in my life that i've realized there comes a point when you just got to pull back the charging handle and fucking see what happens next. You got to do and... the, you got to do the best you can do with the, with your given information um, and your given objective. Um, and if you don't act, then, then, then you'll fail to do anything at all. And none of us want to fail to do anything. We all want to do something. Um, but you also don't want to charge in blindly um, and, and foolishly take yourself seriously um which is a form of blindness right y- yeah presuming you know all the facts is itself a a part of the fog of war <laughs> yeah yeah you have to you have to incorporate that um incomplete um ness into your version of a complete view i agree shall i continue with a beat of your finger do it do it <clears throat> is however this reading whereby the vanishing mediator effectively appears as just a mediator an intermediate figure between two normal states of things the only one possible the conceptual apparatus elaborated by post-marxist political theory about lafort ernesto leclau allows for another reading which radically shifts the perspective within this field the moment of vanishing mediator is the moment defined by elaine badu as that of the event in relation to the established structure. The moment when its truth emerges, the moment of openness, which once the eruption of the event is institutionalized into a new positivity is lost or more precisely becomes literally invisible. According to the well-known commonplace, which contrary to the usual pattern is not a stupidity clothed as wisdom, after the fact backwards, history can always be read as a process governed by law as a meaningful succession of stages However, insofar as we are its agents embedded, caught in the process, the situation appears, at least during the turning points when something is happening, open, undecidable, far from the exposition of an underlying necessity. We find ourselves confronted with responsibility, the burden of decision pressing upon our shoulders. Let us just recall the October Revolution. Retroactively, it is easy to locate it within the wider historical process to show how it emerged out of the specific situation of Russia with its failed modernization and simultaneous presence 
of islands of modernity, highly developed working class and isolated places. In short, it's not too difficult to compose a sociological treatise on this theme. However, it is sufficient to reread the passionate polemics which Lenin, Trotsky, and Mensheviks, the Mensheviks and other participants to find oneself face to face with what is lost in such an objective historical account. The burden of decision in a situation which, so to speak, forced the agents to invent new solutions and make unheard of moves without any guarantee in general laws of historical development. Uh, if I could... Oh, go no, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. You have a question. Do you two notice that, uh, well, like, whenever you make a comment in these exegetical readings to, like, your, your other readers, you'll immediately start reading, and then you'll see, oh, he was thinking the same exact thing, like, at this point, and then started writing about it. Because this is exactly what we were talking about with that whole helmet and void thing. I uh, that 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 may well be the uh I don't know what you would say the uh the side effect or or maybe the result of having read this a few times is that that I I am definitely primed psychologically to to take these points uh next I've I've not only read this but uh, I I've, I've done my own exegesis of this and so I I'm definitely primed for the next ones uh, I don't have that circumstance when I'm reading it and I think that's actually a good thing because I, I I have done everything I can when I'm doing my first reading to to try not to have too many thoughts about it because then I got I get lost in the weeds. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean um, to interrupt you. What were you about? To, I just interrupted you while you were. Never mind. Go ahead. No, it's great. Uh, you, you you interrupt so deftly. Um, yeah. and you back out just as deftly. Uh, so where what I was um gonna remark on here. And I, I don't want to get too too into this because I'm not Heideggerian. I I am not skilled in in that in that uh, stuff. But uh, uh, I can't help but notice a real necessary component of time mm. involved here. Um, when when we're when we're talking about, I mean, everything is revolving around time and the time in which a uh, a decision is made about things. Um, you'll you'll notice that he tends to put scare quotes, for example, around the word objective, almost um, almost always, um, and subject, for example, uh, because because it's it's a it's a question of time whether or not something is in fact ob objective, uh, whether you're in that moment or or not, mm. right? And if you are in that moment, that the things that in later will go on to be seen objectively are not objective at all, and this is. This is a reality that we can we can observe in our own lives uh, every day. We can try to forecast based on things that have happened in the past. Use what we could think of as objective uh, logic to or objective facts to, to forecast what will happen next, and then we will realize that that moment wasn't was still a moment of pure subjectivity. And then we will still look back on it and say, "Damn, we were still forced to act." Yeah. yeah, I agree. And as you said earlier, not only forced to act, but to take these diachronous moments in the past and create a synchronous narrative of the past in the first place, which informs our uh, actions going forward, which I Absolutely. thought was a great point you mentioned. Yeah. Um, sure. Shall I continue? Yeah. Sure. This impossible. This impossible moment of openness constitutes the moment of subjectivity. Subject is a name for that unfathomable X factor called upon, suddenly made accountable thrown into a position of responsibility, into the urgency of decision in such a moment of undecidability. This is the way one has to read Hegel's proposition that the true is to be grasped not only as substance, but equally as subject, not only as an objective process governed by some hidden rational necessity, even if this necessity assumes the Hegelian shape of the cunning of reason, but also as a process punctuated, scanned by the moments of openness, undecidability, when the subject's irreducibly contingent act establishes a new necessity. According to a well-known doxa, the dialectical approach enables us to penetrate the surface play of contingencies and reach the underlying rational necessity which runs the show behind the subject's back. A proper Hegelian dialectical move is almost the exact inversion of this procedure. It disperses the fetish of objective historical process and allows us to see its genesis the way the very historical necessities spring up as a positivization, as a coagulation of erratically contingent decision of the subjects in an open, undecidable situation. Dialectical necessity is always, by definition, a necessity après coup. A proper dialectical account calls into question the self-evidence of what actually took place 
It confronts it with what did not take place. That is, it considers what did not happen, a series of missed opportunities, so alternative histories, a constituent part of what effectively happened. The dialectical attitude towards the problematic of the possible worlds is therefore more paradoxical than it may seem, since what goes on now in our reality is the result of a series of radically contingent acts. The only way to define our actual world properly is to include in its definition the negation of the possible worlds contained in its position. Our lost opportunities are part of what we are. They qualify it in all meanings of the word. Mm. So it's, uh, again, I mean, he's he's kind of reiterating and, and reiterating and reiterating, not to be redundant, uh, the, the point that people have, have taken Hegel wrong. The industry standard understanding of Hegel is backwards. Dialectics does not retrieve the objective by penetrating the subject. The actual process requires a dispelling with the objectivity fetish, the fetishization of objectivity and mm -hmm. situating in it the space of a useful fiction that comes through a convergence of narrative and political exigency what we're what we're what we see people doing <clears throat> is interpreting dialectical necessity as some kind of magic fucking you know magic eight ball <laughs> that's going to tell us the future and and assuming hegel meant that and then using that to say and and isn't that crazy and of course, he didn't mean that, or at least if we take Zizek at his word here, he didn't mean that. That is not that is not the way to approach dialectics. And in a sense, dialectical necessity is a kind of an interesting word because to put a a, <clears throat> a caveat in front of necessity changes it, and it's a it reminds me of a John Stewart thing where he was making fun of Chicago pizza and uh pointing out that the difference between chicago pizza and what you buy in new york is that uh, what what you buy in new york is just fucking pizza there's a reason why you have to put chicago in front of it um and it's because it changes it Di dialectical necessity does not equal uh this is we have come up with we have come up with the formula for how to make necessity yeah. it is that we we are always coming up with that formula but we are yeah. always doing it after the fact yeah you could say it adds depth yeah pizza pun <laughs> I love it. That's so cheesy, man. <laughs> I lost track of where we are. Oh, we're yet at our yet horizon. our horizon. <clears throat> Do you want if you care to take over? Yeah, sure, I'll go. Sure. Uh, yet our horizon of reading the past is determined by the contingent acts we made and which enforce the retroactive illusion of necessity. For this reason, it is impossible for us to occupy a neutral position of pure meta-language from which we could overview all the possible worlds. This means that since the only way to define our own actual world is in terms of its negative relationship to its alternatives, we cannot ever determine the world we actually live in. In other words, to carry the paradox to its extreme, of course, only one world was really possible, namely the one in which we actually live, but since the position of a neutral observer is not accessible to us we don't know which this world is we don't know in which of the possible worlds we actually live there is no you are here fucking sticker on the map the point is not that we will never learn what opportunities we lost but rather that we will never really know what we have got extreme as this position may appear is it not discernible in the everyday phrase we use to designate someone who is unaware of how lucky he was to miss a series of possible catastrophes he doesn't know his own luck if uh fake dialectics does not also mean this then all the talk about or no if dialectics does not also mean this then all of the talk about substance as subject is ultimately null and we're back at reason as substantial necessity pulling the strings behind the stage Basically, we're back at uh, we're back at Kantian. Um, we're back at the uh, the uh, numin numinal and hmm. dust ding and such. It is against this background that we must conceive Hegel's thesis on positing of presuppositions. This retroactive positing is precisely the way necessity arises out of contingency. The moment when the subject posits his presuppositions is the very moment of his effacement as subject. 
the moment he vanishes as a mediator, the moment of closure when the subject's act, act of decision changes into its opposite, establishes a new symbolic network by means of which history again acquires the self-evidence of a linear evolution. Again, it acquires that self-evidence of a linear evolution. Uh, let us return to the October Revolution. Its, quote, presuppositions, and quote, were, quote, unquote, posited when, after its victory and the consolidation of the new power, the openness of the situation was again lost. When it was again possible to assume the position of an obje objective observer and narrate the linear progression of events, ascertaining how Soviet power broke the imperialist chain at its weakest link, and thus started a new epoch of world history and so on. In this strict sense, the subject is a vanishing mediator. It act, its act succeeds by becoming invisible, by positivizing itself into a new symbolic network, wherein it locates and explains itself as a result of historical process, thus reducing itself to a mere moment of the totality engendered by its own act. Witness the Stalinist position of pure meta-language where, contrary to the commonplaces about proletarian science and whatnot, the very engagement of Marxist theory on the side of the proletariat, its partisanship, its taking sides, is not conceived as something inherent to the theory as such. Marxists did not speak from the subjective position of the proletariat. They based their orientation on the proletariat from an external, neutral, objective position. Mm. This is a big block quote. In the 80s of the past century, in the period of the struggle between the Marxists and the Narodniks, the proletariat in Russia constituted an insignificant minority of the population, whereas the individual peasants constituted the vast majority. But the proletariat was developing as a class, whereas the peasantry as a class was disintegrating. And just because the proletariat was developing as a class, the Marxists based their orientation on the proletariat. And they were not mistaken for, as we know, the proletariat subsequently grew from an insignificant force into a first-rate historical political force. It's the end of the block quote. The crucial question to be asked here, of course, is at the time of their struggle against the Narodniks, where did the Marxists speak from to be subject to mistake in their choice of the proletariat as the basis for their orientation? Obviously, from an external point encompassing the historical process as a field of objective forces, where one must be careful not to be mistaken and be guided by just forces, those that will win. In short, where one must bet on the right horse. Of course, they were able to bet on the right horse. They, they, were, they were in uh, uh, Back to the Future 2. Go Biff. Uh, read this way, that is retroactively, the, the decision on how to act follows the objective evaluation. First, we view the situation from a neutral, objective position. Then, after ascertaining which are the forces likely to win, we decide to base our orientation on them. I mean, just the, I love this, the pure cynicism in this. I just love it. This uh, retroactive narr narration, however, falls prey to a kind of illusion of perspective. It misrecognizes the crucial fact that the true reason for deciding only becomes apparent once the decision has been taken. In other words, reasons for basing our orientation on the proletariat become apparent only to those who already speak from the proletarian subjective position. Or, as perspicacious theologians would put it, of course, there are good reasons to believe in Jesus Christ, but these reasons are fully comprehensible only to those who already believe in him. And the same goes also for the famous Leninist theory of the weakest link in the chain of imperialism. One does not first ascertain by an objective pr pr approach which is the weakest link and then take the decision to strike at this point. The very act of decision defines the weakest link. This is what Lacan calls act, a move that, so to speak, defines its own conditions retroactively produces grounds which justify it. There's a block quote. What is impossible for those who count on an objective appraisal of conditions is that a gesture could create conditions which retroactively justify it and make it appropriate. It is, however, attested that this is what happens and that the aim is not to see things correctly, but to blind oneself sufficiently to be able to strike the right way. For example, the way that disperses. End quote. The act is thus performative in a way which exceeds the speech act. Its performativity is retroactive. It redefines the network of its own presuppositions. This excess of the act's 
retroactive performativity can also be formulated in the terms of the Hegelian dialectics of law and its transgression, crime. From the perspective of the existing positive laws of a symbolic community, an act appears by definition as crime since it violates its symbolic limits and introduces an unheard of element, which turns everything topsy-turvy. There is neither rhyme nor reason in an act. An act is by its very nature scandalous, as was the very appearance of Christ in the eyes of the keepers of the existing law. That is, before Christ was Christianized, made part of the new law of Christian tradition. Here I will pause uh, to mention that would would it, you know be a, a kind of a clear indication of why baptism was kept, mm. right? Yes. We we have a means of continuing to Christianize things, people. Otherwise, you'd have you'd have that. I think you. Well, I don't know what would happen otherwise, but I, I can kind of see that as being like a a. Oh, please. Go no, go ahead. Keep going. I think that's interesting that, that you pointed that out because, you know, there's there's something uh, relating to this dialectic here and the act that the the following order that that sprouts following this act kind of has to paper over the the uh, ontological void in which it sprouted from and thus like you know come up with these uh excuses for it i suppose or not excuses a sub ritual supposed to know yeah and, yeah and maintain rituals if you if you do the ritual it, it, a couple of things happens one everybody was expecting that ritual to happen and then it got done and so you have you have a wonderful a wonderful continuity of prophecy and fulfillment and and two Everyone is united by that same ritual. And so you have you have a cohesive group formed mm -hmm. by this by this cultural and, artifact. And that's where you find the Protestant uh, subject, because if they were, I mean, you can say you can go back and say this is the entire like reason, like because in, in an effort to preserve this, they actually got rid of the core of it. And in, in, so, mm -hmm. you know, you can we can kind of like in a sort of cynical way like uh kind of put ourselves back there and say oh you know what maybe he was wrong to maintain his subjective position uh martin luther was and keep baptism oppose the peasants revolt but again his entire like source of enjoyment you know he, he was like a monk who just like ate all day was in the bathroom uh for quite a lot uh very large man and, and just wrote like a post he was a poster um you know, and it's interesting how, how that has kind of like that's that's what's been preserved from there, I guess, is posting and that well, entire source of enjoyment. The 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 function of of keeping some of some of the traditions of the system that you're you're uh, usurping is a was a is a long established Christian tradition. Right. I mean, that's essentially the Christian tradition is appropriating cultural uh uh, rituals and it, reforming them to suit the needs of the of the incoming administration that is absolutely you know so well, that, you need to have a way of of transitioning from the former normal to the new normal that's why and, it's been so successful because it's empty yeah it's empty it doesn't need to it, it doesn't need to, it hardly even needs to vanish actually <laughs> in its mediation uh, part of the way it works is that it's working right in front of you and uh you know I, from speaking as a person who was raised in a in a, a episcopalian which is a which is a eventually a, a form of protestantism and but went to catholic school i got to witness these rituals from both sides there's others that are that are the same but different for example in the catholic tradition you you confess in private in the in the protestant tradition you confess publicly in in front of everyone not really but they 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 ritualistically confess in front of everyone. They confess to everything in front of everyone. And uh there's something there's something um very interesting about the 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 bizarro world that each of them represent to each other and the fact that they continue to exist alongside each other. Um mm. also very interesting. Yeah. Although I would say I think the Protestant mode of enjoying is is the one we're currently still has really, you know, rooted itself in our subjectivity. Hmm. Uh, with, with one caveat, which is that if, if anything, if anything gave us our modern world 
more than bureaucracy. I don't know what it is. And the Catholic Church is very, very clearly responsible for what we know of today as bureaucracy. Um, and I think I think that's a I, I think that is a key component that seems to be glossed over entirely, which is that we are used to things working by the book because that has been the way shit has worked for at least the last 2000 years. Hmm. And uh, that is what the Catholic Church, I mean, that's what they essentially inherited from Rome was the ability to govern at long distances. And the only way you do that is by the desk. Mm -hmm. um i think i was re i i stopped at made part of uh the new law of christian tradition is that right yep and the dialectical genesis renders visible again the scandalous origins of the existing law let us just recall again chesterton's perspicacious remark about how the detective story keeps in some sense before the mind the fact that civilization itself is the most sensational of departures and the most romantic of rebellions it is based on the fact that morality is the most dark and daring of conspiracies. The dialectical approach brings to light to the light of day this forgotten reverse of law, the way law itself coincides with supreme criminal transgression, and an act succeeds the moment it sutures anew its own past, its own conditions, effacing its scandalous character. The act is the emergence of the new master signifier, that supplementary beat of your finger, which miraculously changes the previous chaos into new harmony. Folks, I don't get poetry. I, I have been playing music my whole fucking life. I've written dozens of songs. I don't understand this. And it's probably if I knew someone who understood this, this poem and could explain to me, I would get something out of it. But I just don't fucking get it. I just don't get it, but I'll read it. Uh, a beat of your finger on the drum discharges the sounds and begins the new harmony. A step by you, and new men arise and set on their march. Your head turns away, the new love. Your head turns back, the new love. Okay, well, I guess I sort of get it. So it's talking about how the uh, the beat is the moment between the new love before and the new love now. Free beer tomorrow. What is lost after the onset of the new harmony is the radically contingent, scandalous, abyssal character of the new master signifier. Witness, for example, the transformation of Lenin into a wise figure who saw it all and foresaw it all. Stalinism included with the Leninist hagiography. This is why it is only today, after the breakdown of Leninism, that it becomes possible to approach Lenin as an actor in the historical drama capable of making unforeseen moves that were, as Lezik Kolakowski uh, put it so succinctly, the right mistakes at the right time. So we've been going for close to two hours here. Shall we call it? Um, I think... Oh, it's a little longer than I thought. I thought this last subsection was a little shorter. I think this is actually the the long one. Yeah, not too bad. Well, this is this is the one I guess that takes us to the uh, this one. This this one takes us to the uh, to the section to the end of the section to the section break. And uh, is this where you where you were gonna consummate Matan? Or do you want to? Oh, dude, we need to see Matan consummate. Yeah, I, I, I would like to see that if I'm you down. want. To... I'm down. I, I, I don't give a fuck. I'm down. I don't. I don't mean to sound like an idiot, but what do you mean? You, you had said at the beginning of this conversation that you had a uh, an argument that you were developing, and uh, oh, and, I, I've uh, been, uh, I've been kind of trying to weave it in with this entire like unwritten law thing. Yeah, in this uh, sort of zone between two deaths, which which involves, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll kind of explicate it more clearly now before we get into this. Cool. Uh, no, no, I actually let me just point out it's once chapter section two starts that he really gets into this, and I've been trying to kind of like re reverse and bend reverse. into this. Yeah, but okay, it, it's basically like uh, it involves the necessity of like uh, I don't know, of papering over subjectivity. 
in order to hide subjectivity, in order to create subjectivity. Mm -hmm. um, create I, subjectivity or create objectivity? You, you create, the subject creates objectivity by obscuring its own subjectivity. Yes. So it's, I think, I think that then hopefully like, uh, makes sense. I, I agree with that. It's yeah. Subject, it's, uh, a subject creates object by self exteriorizing itself from itself and calling that object. Yeah. So and, like and a, a, a misrecognition. Subject. Yeah. And, and the, the crucial point is that the symbolic law, this, this sort of, a what it papers over the split, the nut, the, the sort of empty space there is itself within symbolic law. So the death drive within the subject, and this 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 ties into the act, uh, which we'll go into, is itself a foundational principle of the law itself. That that's something that I think is really important. The connection between the subject and the law through death drive. Okay. I I I struggle with the concept of death drive. I often find that it's one of those it's one of those concepts that I I often go oh that's what it means oh wait this is this is death drive and then I will return to that thought later and I will realize that I had I had lost the the thread that got me there that's um, death drive that's the, it's it's self exteriorizing and saying I lost that <laughs> You can't do that to me. No, that, that's exactly how he describes it. It's like, oh, I forgot what was that thing about me that, that was uh, so crucial uh, in order to, for me to have this totalized understanding of something. Um, so and, so and, I, I, I want to into, think of... Sorry, it ties directly into uh, Zupanchish kind of... Uh, well, she, she ties uh, Lacan's lamella to this. It ties into our participation in social and sexual reproduction which in, in, is in a sense like considered like an amoeba when it splits and things like that. It's still one amoeba. Mm -hmm. But when we split, we, we kind of like, oh, what just happened? <laughs> and like, I'm not that thing anymore. <laughs> and and that, that's also the emergence of like sexuality as well. Um, and that's inherent to the law itself. So I, I, I think to speak in terms <clears throat> that feel more grounded to me, uh, I'm going to I'm just going to hazard a uh, uh, what I feel like is maybe a a, a more uh, vulgar uh, interpretation um, to think about, especially the law subjectively. Um, if if it it's it seems like I wouldn't want to follow a law that wasn't objective in nature that if it was objective in nature, at least I would I would be able to say, well, then that's a law that should apply everywhere and to everyone equally. And therefore it it has an inherent it has an inherent fairness to it. Whereas if there is a subjectivity to law, I would find myself thinking, well shit, what about my subjectivity? Um, when you and but, the thing is when you look at the subjectivity of the law, which you perceive as an object as external to you, and mm -hmm. when you try to look at that void, you do not see death. You don't see nothing. You don't see your end as a subject. You instead see your own libidinal sexuality reflected back at you. I have, again, I have trouble. I have trouble with conceiving of the sexual uh, uh, field at play here. And it is likely because I'm ignorant um, in Freudian uh, psychoanalysis. I'm ignorant in the Zupanchic uh text that we're going to be reading soon here um so I'm, I'm looking forward to that so i have trouble relating to it on 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 the libidinal side of things um but so I, think of it like like a like a, a, a libidinal a libidinal investment in in a knowledge that is always going to fail anyway or a, a libidinal a libidinal excuse me a libidinal investment in a pursuit of something that is necessarily going to fail what and you know that? that, but you know that, but you also pretend not to know that. And and that's what that's that's what allows it to be exciting. What is it? The sacred heart or the beautiful soul? That's pretty much the entire point. It is it, the subject is like confronted with their own like death drive as what was like kind of pushing them forward. Uh, 
it's still kind of opaque. I mean, I still very opaque. In the past, in the past, I have tried to articulate what I think of the death drive as the thing that kept me standing in the turret in a firefight, knowing that if I duck, I'll be definitely I'll my my truck, not just me, but my truck is done. Right. So I have to do the opposite thing of what makes sense, which is stand up, put my head out there and return fire, even though that puts me in the most what seems to be the most direct uh danger right and that to that in a sense is the way i conceived of or at least i'm trying to conceive of death drive in that it it is it it seems like a uh the worst possible thing to do but the 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 thing that has to be done to accomplish what what i need to accomplish but it feels like i have it backwards Matan. No, that's totally correct because oh pardon me i'll just say this one more comment think about like duels like duels from the old times like that seems like the most insane thing ever to just stand across from each other and especially not even the ones where you like draw and see who draws quickest the one where you like take turns shooting at each other think about that and, and think about how like a subject could be con- convinced that there's something necessary about me being here and doing this the same way you were convinced that you have to like uh you have to stand up in order to for the logic of the situation to kind of proceed uh, or, or in the terms of skateboarding to connect to Nance, the fact that like you have to like fail over and over again doing the same trick in order to not even like really learn anything just to kind of like have the thing happen the, the way it's supposed to happen. Hmm. So that's, I guess maybe this then better connects to the reason I bake my own bread. And I'm like constantly baking, I bake, I bake my, all my family's bread. Mm-hmm. and there's it's it has become all completely ritualistic in my household in fact to the point where my daughter just baked her first loaf and it was kind of a big deal around here that's tight and nice it, and uh it's it's like you know there's that bread is going to be consumed there's going to need to be more i'm never going to be able to stop baking bread as long as i want to have bread of course that's i can your, go to the store baptism. and buy some that's your form of baptism yeah it's my rebirth Yep. Sorry, Nance, what were you going to say? I was going to hazard something. Um, it's kind of like a, like an investment in, in the fantasy of an act um, that you know isn't ever going to pay off, but you... But somehow, but somehow reality stages itself such that it does actually, not only does it pay off, but then the, the actual logic requires that like blindness yes yeah so yeah. then c- the cognitive kentucky windage then is uh the thing i brought up before a uh, different conversation you've got to take a shot and then find out where it lands to realize where the target was i think that might mm, i don't i haven't thought about how that would relate to death drive but i think it does because it is that um the it's in the pursuit it's it's the pursuit and it's the um yeah and that's reflected in the external world itself that very like undecidability that's necessarily reflected in the Mm -hmm. so it can't just it can't just exist as a thought experiment inside of you it has to be it has to be it has to exist as a thought experiment outside of you too outside of you you have to literally <laughs> as, physically as a, as a manifest. matter experiment yeah mm. yeah okay but i think, I, I think we kind of uh I, i'm fine with going forward but i just don't want to you know hold anyone up what do you guys say do we end it here or keep going till section two um, well i wanted matan to consummate it sounds like he did um yeah, I'm, I actually, I'm, I think I I'm gonna be thinking about that too. You know, then, then let's let's just cut things off there. I think that's a good point. Just do that. Um, also, I'd like to publicly thank you know Adam for all these wonderful reading videos. I listened to all of the, these readings twice over before I even approached the reading myself. I'm very appreciative. Yeah, yeah well, um, we're, we're all very lucky for for all the work that everybody's putting in this shit i think that's it's one of those scary scary moments in my life when i'm seeing other people actually actually doing work uh 
it's like <laughs> oh god i hope they keep going <laughs> we're, we're raising the bar or or at least trying to uh raise the bar for ourselves and each other because i think i know for me personally that's the only way anything gets done is when there is a bar to be raised you know matan just for the for the record I'm in my mind, I'm thinking I'm going to be reading this shit anyway, you know, uh, I'm going to be reading this anyway. And if I, I'm the kind of person where I have to have like a goal or else I just, if I don't have a goal, I'm going to, I'm going to fucking go on to something else because I'm very eclectic. And so I set myself to the goal of, if I read this shit, I, I'm going to make a video of this then I'm definitely going to read it. And so it works kind of to my ends and then, you know, publishing it, uh it's just an act of of just total hubris like you know what let's if i do this then then it's done like i'm i'm actually um how do i say i'm i'm conspicuously doing the work ideally that will instigate someone else to 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 also do to do the shit cuz you can't possibly look worse than me on this shit you know what i mean like you can't possibly misread these things worse than 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 i do in order yeah. to honor your self-professed uh, uh, selfishness and opportunism, then I will re- rescind my, uh, my my gratitude towards you. Screw nice. you. Nice. <laughs> also, Nance is Nance is not an anarchist, which is the which is uh, how you know he's he's such an anarchist because yeah. he's he's avowedly not not an anarchist. Yeah, it's absolutely the most not. Thing you can be is not not an anarchist. Well, thanks for right. you. Thank you guys so much. Um, Have a great night. Be safe. We'll see you guys soon.